Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving on uh, Thursday, and that today's episode adds to your holiday cheer. While I had some ideas of what I might like to do for this special, when I found out about the existence of uh, today's program, I knew that this is just the perfect thing for the amazing world of radio. And this is the Elgin Holiday Specials, sponsored by the Elgin Watch Company. And these were specials that began airing in 1941, as America was ramping up its defense and continued on into World War II. And it was a way to connect the whole country. And in particular, Elgin made the focus on connecting uh, everybody at home to the troops that were overseas and providing a really superb show. The Elgin uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving specials continued until at least 1948. Uh, that is the last uh, episode that I could find available, and I couldn't find information on when exactly they stopped. Now, I will warn you that some of the comedians use some topical humor, which... Uh, if you don't know a whole lot about the period, can be hard to get. I will give you a clue to one joke that I, I think I can help you out with. Uh, one thing to remember, and it comes up in the course of this episode, is that Henry Wallace, who was FDR's vice president during his third term and was replaced with Harry Truman, uh, and uh, also had been a member of the cabinet, was looking to start a third party. With that, I think I've told you about as much as I can, and this is a two-hour program, and that's part of the reason why we're trying to get this out on a Sunday, so you can listen to it in pieces, or you can have some flexibility and find just the right time to listen to this or share it. Uh, the original air date, November 26, 1947. Let's go ahead and take a listen to the Elgin uh, Thanksgiving show. Hint Hunt, presented by the makers of Chiffon Flakes and Armor Canned Meats, and Lum and Abner, presented by the makers of Alka-Seltzer, usually broadcast on Thursday afternoon over many of these stations, will not be heard today due to the special broadcast which follows immediately. <laughs> The Elgin Watch Company, makers of fine American watches for over 80 years, presents its sixth annual Thanksgiving Day greeting to America. Two hours of star-studded entertainment broadcast throughout the United States, to our veterans' hospitals, and to our armed forces overseas, so that those loved ones of yours in the service may celebrate with us and shortwave round the world. In the next two hours, in the order of their appearance, Elgin brings you Don Amici, Alan Jones, Jimmy Durante, and Gary Moore. Mary Jane Smith, Sir Lancelot, Larry Starch, Margaret Whiting, Vera Vague, the Paige Cavanaugh Trio, Bob Sweeney and Hal March, the Doctors of Harmony, Hootie Menuhin, Jack Benny, Mr. Kitzel, Red Skelton, and the Elgin Orchestra and Chorus under the direction of Louis Silvers. And here is your host for the full two hours, Don Amici. As a time-honored greeting for this day, ladies and gentlemen, it's Happy Thanksgiving. And all the stars Ken Carpenter just mentioned join me and the Elgin Watch Company and the Elgin Jewelers in wishing you a very happy Thanksgiving. Many of them are old friends of yours, others are newcomers, stars of tomorrow. All joined together to bring the warmth of their personalities and good wishes into your homes this Thanksgiving day. For Thanksgiving, perhaps more than any other day we celebrate, is the holiday of home. A simple day without tinsel or fireworks recalling the little things long remembered when the thoughts of those separated by the miles turn back to their beginnings, to friends and family, to home. In the spirit of Thanksgiving at home, Alan Jones sings, 
It's a grand night for singing. It's a grand night for singing. The moon is flying high. And somewhere a bird who is bound, he'll be heard. He's throwing his heart at the sky. It's a grand night for singing. The stars are bright above. The earth is aglow, and to add to the show, I think I am falling in love. Falling, falling in love. Maybe it's more than the moon. Maybe it's more than the sight of the night In a night too lovely for words Maybe it's more than the earth Shiny and silvery blue Maybe the reason I'm feeling this way Has something to do with you It's a grand night for singing The moon is flying Somewhere a bird who is bound, he'll be heard. He's throwing his heart in the sky. It's a grand night for singing. The stars are right above. The earth is glow and the right to the show. I think I am born in love. Oh, I think that I am Wonderful, Alan, just wonderful. It is a grand night for singing, and we'll be looking forward to you providing more of it later. Wherever you find song, you'll find laughter. And Elgin's Two Hours of Stars wouldn't be complete without the laughter generated in millions of American homes by two gentlemen known as the nose and the haircut. Reunited for the first time since they acquired shows of their own, Elgin is particularly proud to be able to bring Jimmy and Junior back together again this Thanksgiving. Here's the younger half of the partnership, a young man who often pays a buck for a haircut, but seldom gets clipped for the $64. Gary Moore! Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Amachi. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Awfully nice to be with you on this happy Thanksgiving. In fact, as the lightning bug said when he caught his tail in the pencil sharpener, I am delighted no end. John, you wait right here. I'll go back and come in again, huh? Gary, you're always welcome on the Elgin program. We're just so happy to see you. Well, I'm happy too, Don. In fact, as a lightning bug said, when he caught his tail in the pencil sharpener, I'm delighted. No end. <laughs> Would you care to go around once more? Thank you, no. Tell me, Gary, what is that unpredictable mind of yours cooked up for this year's program? Well, Don, I thought maybe this year the people would like something sort of educational, you know, like, like uh, well, like maybe a lecture or something. A lecture, mm -hmm. huh? Like on what subject? Well, like maybe a special lecture for single ladies visiting our town for the first time, entitled, What to do when accosted on the street by a strange man, and what streets to walk down to make sure you'll be. <laughs> you, think, uh, you think something like that might be useful, Don? Well, uh, uh, yes, in a limited sort of way. Mm -hmm. But uh, how about something with more appeal for the masses? For the masses? Oh, for us, I've got the very thing. Movie gossip. Oh, you like movies. Oh, and dude, I be. Don, I am, I am especially crazy about those pictures with one-word titles, like shock, lured, pursued, possessed. And next year, David O. Selznick is going to present the greatest of them all. What's it called? Pooped. <laughs> I don't know. It, it should be just ginger peachy. Meanwhile, stand aside, Don, as I present the latest and intimate news scoops gathered from all over Hollywood. Here's a scoop. I was talking yesterday to Rodney Blupford, the actor. He tells me his next picture will be a remake of the old hit, He Who Gets Slapped. Rodney will play the title role, He Who. <laughs> Obviously a Chinese character. Exclusive, Stupendous Pictures has just announced plans for their latest epic. It'll cost $5 billion with 5,000 stars... 3,000 extras, 500 producers, and 200 directors. The picture will be called... 
Just plain Bill. <laughs> Attention! I was talking to Orson Welles yesterday as he sneaked down Hollywood Boulevard trying not to attract any attention. He was riding a flamingo side saddle. <laughs> <laughs> and Orson tells me that he is going into the perfume business as a sideline It seems that while on location in South America He picked up several undiscovered rare odors He has mixed them all together and is calling this passionate mixture Glendale <laughs> Sounds just fine this, this perfume, friends, will come in three styles for three different types of girls The first one is for very smart, sophisticated girls it's called... Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the second perfume is for the more indefinite type. It's called... Maybe. And the third type is for very dumb girls. It's called... Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we, we wish you luck, Austin. And here for my final scoop is the hottest news ever to come out of Hollywood. New York and Florida papers, st please stand by. The news, ladies and gentlemen, is this... Ping pong spelled backwards is pronounced gnip gnip. <laughs> Thank you. Gary, I don't know what I wouldn't give to hear that all over again. Oh, thank you, Don. I wouldn't give anything either. <laughs> Besides, I haven't the time, old man. I'm, I'm expecting a phone call. A phone call? Oh, from an old sweetheart? Don, you couldn't have phrased it more neatly. Hello, Elgin program. Gary Moore speaking. Hello, Junior. This is Jimmy. Jimmy Durante, we're on the air. Why aren't you here? I'm having such a good time, I forgot, Junior. I'm at a big New Year's Eve party. Jimmy, New Year's Eve isn't for a month and a half. What are you doing there? Johnny Myers is picking up the checks, so we wanted to get started early. <laughs> Well, slip into something loose and come down here right away. And surely enough, here he comes now, the little man with the big nose and the heart to match, the one and only Jimmy Durante in person. Gotta start off each day with a song. Now even when things go wrong, you feel better, you even look better. Stop the music, stop the music. Okay, you asked for it. No matter what you do to Evelyn, you just can't stop that magic violin. Ah, <laughs> uh, Snazzo, seeing you across the mic again is like two weeks in the country. You're, you're my buddy boy. Likewise, Junior, you're my fudge cake. And you're my doll buggy. And you're my dream boot. In fact, you're the finest, dearest, truest friend a fella ever had. If you listen in Russia, see how easy it is? <laughs> Well, I, I don't want to appear maudlin, James, but I'm so overwhelmed to be working with you again that, well, Jim, I'm, I'm going to kiss you on both cheeks. I didn't know it was this serious. Here's my fraternity pin. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how I, that's the way I feel, like kissing you on both cheeks. Here now. <clears throat> First, I kiss your left cheek. Now, the right cheek. You should have remembered, Junior. It's quite a trip around my nose. <laughs> The super chief said it's a must if you're traveling the scenic route. <laughs> well, the trip was worth it, James. I feel happier. Now I do. Me too. In fact, Garrison, my heart is traveling with congenial junk annuity and palpitations of conciliatory tranquility. That salutates my being with comps and yuri eight, begrillement of our spurious pub in annuity. <laughs> Oh, Jim, how can you say a thing like that? I just opened my mouth and hoped for the best. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you the same old schnozzle. Tell me, James, what's, what's new with you since we've been separated? Junior, things have been going from bad to bedlam. No. But one thing, the new fashions the women are wearing leave me in a continual state of non compass mental. You mean the, the fashions are bothering you, James? Incessantly. Why, just the other day, I followed somebody down the street who was wearing one of these new outfits with padded hips and the extra broad shoulders. What happened? Congratulate me, Junior. I'm now engaged to a quarterback from USC. <laughs> I know what you mean. No, those new long skirts are pretty terrible. You can say that again. Nowadays, every time I go into a restaurant, I order chicken. Just so I can look at legs again. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
That's life, I guess. But say, Jim, I, I have a note on my cuff here to apologize to you. I'm, I'm sorry I was too busy to get to your party last night. I'm sorry, too, Junior. The joint was a muck with, exu with exuberant. <laughs> I thought I could have went a little further without missing. <laughs> Why, every big star in radio business was there. Bob Hope, Red Skelton, Joan Davis, Bing Crosby, Oil and Joe Peppapoo. Whirling Joe Peppapoo, what does he do that's so important in radio? When Porsche gets tired of facing life, he turns her around. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Durante, don't bother looking back. Nobody can follow you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like quite a party, Jim. Tell me, did you, um, did you invite any of the gang from your latest picture this time for keeps? Of a certainty, Junior. Esther Williams was there and what a hunk of feminine culture, too. Yeah? And besides from being beautiful, she's doing all right financially, too. Yeah, Jim, but money doesn't really mean much to Esther. You know, just the other day I heard her say, you can't take it with you. Yeah, but with what she's got, I'd sure like to help her carry it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, your, your party was an unqualified success then, huh? Yes, Junior, except for one thing. Huh? You see, next door to me, Atwater Kent was throwing a party too. Mm -hmm. But Henry Wallace kept coming in and stealing guests from Atwater's party. Then he'd come in and steal guests from my party. Henry Wallace was stealing guests? Yes, he'd do anything to start a third party. <laughs> Now, there's a joke that is fraught with no significance. <laughs> I agree, Pete, totally. Besides, James, it's time for us to get to work. What do you, um, uh, what do you want to do for the people this year? With me, it's immaterial. Maybe they'd like a little music. Well, maybe. I'll, I'll ask somebody in the band. Say, um, uh, you there with the oboe, you've heard us play and sing before. How do you feel about us doing a musical number? I'm feeling mighty low. <laughs> That guy's tonsil should wear elevator shoes. <laughs> but I'll ignore his shabby attitude. Mr. Silver's a fanfare, if you please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I shall now sing a song at the piano, accompanied quietly by Gary Moore at the drum. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mr. Moore, you have an eight-bar rest. Would you like to try for 16? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Jim. We'll start from the pasta fazul, Mr. Moore. All right. Soft. Soft. Right. Say, I know a fellow. A fellow. A fellow who can make your life so mellow. Ah, so mellow. May I ask what that was, Mr. Moore? But frankly, Jim, I was trying to drown out the sound of that piano. You know, it sounds kind of peculiar. It does have a peculiar tone. I better raise the lid and look inside. <laughs> Sorry, Princess Elizabeth, I didn't mean to disturb your hideaway. <laughs> We'll begin again, Mr. Moore. Here we go. There's one like him in every town. He's half a man and half a town. They call him Briago. Could be mayor of New York or of Chicago. Woo-hoo! Briago. Razors came from Portland, Maine to San Diego. Junior, Junior. <laughs> Why, yes, you're not to interrupt me when I'm getting sent. I hate to say this, Jim, but you are not only getting sent, you are giving off one. <laughs> Mr. Moore, remember the old Chinese saying? He who ridiculous Durante winds up with a fat lip. <laughs> Mr. Silvers, pick it up at the bridge. I'll pay the toll later. When you worry, better send for hombre. I'll go in a hurry. He... Got lots of time, that's all he spends his time. He never spends a dime. So telegram for Mr. Durani. So... Telegram, for Mr. telegram. telegram. I, I'll take it, boy, right over here. Why, why, Jim, it's from the management of the Hollywood Bowl. Well, uh, the Hollywood Bowl? Yeah. They must want me to make an offer. Say, what does it say? Uh, <laughs> that's what it says on the No, thing it doesn't here. either. <laughs> You're reading the part in Morse code. Let's take it again. Uh, the Hollywood Bowl. And please, please do not correct me in public. <laughs> Jim, the 
telegram is from the management of the Hollywood Bowl. The Hollywood Bowl? They must want to make me an offer. I phrased it for myself. <laughs> what does it say? After the next concert they have, they want you to watch the ring from around the bowl. <laughs> I've been stabbed. Why, just last month I played a concert at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. I played with such terrifying force that the clouds began to gather around my head. And when I reached the climax, the clouds opened up and the hail came down. The hail, you say? What's your language? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can be transcribed for a more inconvenient time. <laughs> Continue, Mr. Silvers. So, when you feel low, better send for my friend Umbria. Let me hear that band. Umbria, go. Could be mayor of New York or of Chicago. <laughs> Umbriaco. Razors came from Portland, Maine to San Diego. <laughs> what do you know? Tchaikovsky just finished his fifth. <laughs> When you're worried, better send for Umbriago in a hurry. Say he's got lots of time, that's all he spends his time, he never spends a time. Junior, 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 Junior. I beg, I beg of you, Junior. Believe me, Jim, there is nothing I can do that's going to hurt this tune. Just a minute, you <laughs> do. There's a man here with a message from the sponsor, Mr. Elgin. A message from the sponsor? Well, what is it? Rack a sound of a friend with a sort of feet in a rima song. Answer a bottle water and a manly strander with a fine scan. Well, if that's the way he feels, okay. Junior, what was the message? That was Mumbles. We've just been replaced by his quartet. <laughs> Let's go home, Mr. Duretti. Let's go, Mr. Moore. So, when you feel the Better send for my friend Umbriaco. Oh, that was great, Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore. Say, Ken, do you hear that? Don't tell me it's raining. Oh. Don, you know it couldn't be raining here in California. Our sound effects man is merely helping me illustrate for our listeners the little-known fact that it can rain inside your watch. Yes, in spite of all possible protection, it can rain inside your watch, for there's air in your watch. When, like the air outside, it's humid, and then there comes a sudden drop in temperature, a droplet of moisture can form inside the watch case, a miniature rainstorm. The result, sometimes very quickly, sometimes later... Ping goes the mainspring, weakened by rust. But now Elgin watches have a miracle mainspring that will not rust. Not only rust-proof, the Europower mainspring holds its springiness indefinitely for greater accuracy through the years. Elgin's new Europower mainspring actually eliminates 99% of watch repairs due to steel mainspring failures. Only Elgin watches have Europower mainsprings, and at no extra cost to you. Elgin, with its beauty and style leadership... Elgin, with its time to the stars accuracy. And now, Elgin's exclusive Durapower mainspring. You can be sure the loved one you surprise with a watch this Christmas will be so much happier with an Elgin. Look for the symbol DP on the dial, the symbol of Durapower mainspring. But uh, shop early for your gift Elgins. They're America's most wanted watches, and the demand far exceeds the supply. <laughs> Samuel Butler once wrote that youth, like spring, is an overpraised season. But if the success of child stars on the screen is any criterion, the record seems to prove the contrary. We think one of Elgin's brightest new stars someday might fill the shoes of Deanna Durbin and Catherine Grayson. Just a little over five foot three, topped with golden brown hair, charming 15-year-old Mary Jane Smith. Mary Jane, ever since I heard you sing the part of Snow White on the air with Charlie McCarthy, you've been one of my favorite youngsters. 
Thank you, Mr. Amici. You've always been one of my favorites, too. Uh, among the older actors. <laughs> the older actors? Mary Jane, I've made love to Myrna Loy, Loretta Young, Joan Bennett, and Jean Tierney. Gee, no wonder you're always smiling. Well, from what I've heard from MGM about your singing, Mary Jane, you have plenty of reason to be smiling yourself these days. Tell me, has singing on the screen always been your big ambition? No. Someday I hope to sing at the Metropolitan. I've already memorized the scores of seven operas. Oh, that's quite an achievement. I can't even remember the ball game scores. <laughs> well, if you've forgotten the score of the World Series, it was four games to three. Four games to three? Uh, how'd you happen to know that? I'm from Brooklyn. We were robbed. <laughs> Well, it looks to me like Brooklyn finally has a winner. Uh, tell me, have you made any pictures yet, Mary Jane? No, I'm still taking vocal lessons and going to school on the lot. Every day, I eat lunch with Dean Stockwell, Claude Jarman Jr., Elizabeth Taylor, or Margaret O'Brien. Why don't you join me someday? Oh, I'd love to. Let me know when you're eating with Lana Turner. <laughs> in the meantime, Mary Jane, I'd like to invite all our listeners to join me in listening to you sing the beautiful O Luce di Quest Anima, O Light Divine That Shines From Love. From the opera Linda de Chamonix, Elgin is proud to present the talented young coloratura discovery, Mary Jane Smith. <laughs> Beautiful, Mary Jane, just beautiful. The music of America is as varied as its people. Embracing the top tunes of Tin Pan Alley, the operas and symphonies of the Metropolitan, and folk music ranging all the way from Negro spirituals to the hillbilly music of the mountains. 
One of our most recent arrivals is Calypso music. And with us today on Elgin's Two Hours of Stars is the man who introduced and popularized it in this country, Sir Lancelot. <laughs> Just how would you describe Calypso music, Sir Lancelot? Well, when you set to music some news or a speech, you get Calypso, Mr. Amige. You make up a verse the best way you're able and always put the accent on your wrong syllable. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, that's very interesting, Sir Lancelot. <laughs> Are there any items in the news you could put the wrong syllable on right now? Oh, yes. Uh, for example, uh, with the new telescope at Palomar, they can see much more of every star. So the men up there, as soon as they're able, will probably peek at Betty Grable. <laughs> and that's the Calypso version of an important item in the news, huh? <laughs> yes, Mr. Michi, but here's the most important news of all. If you are looking for a gift that will forever endure An Elgin watch is perfect, you may rest assured For in watchmaking circles, the talk of the hour Is Elgin Miracle Mainspring Dura Power The finest steel mainspring ever made will rust But in Elgin's Dura Power you can place your trust A brand new secret alloy development Eliminates mainspring failures 99% Yes, this greatest watch improvement in 200 years Makes an Elgin watch for Christmas a gift that endears Their beauty and accuracy will make you exclaim It's the loveliest watch to bear the proud Elgin name So for a famous Elgin watch, time to the stars Just see your friendly jeweler for particulars Whether it's Lord or Lady Elgin, you will say An Elgin is a joy to give on Christmas Day Thank you, Sir Lancelot. It was just two Thanksgivings ago that a 21-year-old sailor returned from active duty in the South Pacific and made his debut as an unknown entertainer here on the Elgin program. Since then, his remarkable talent for mimicry has won him a star in his dressing rooms at nightclubs throughout the nation. He's back with us this Thanksgiving, this time a star himself, Larry Storch. Keeping track of Larry today would be quite a task, for he's equally adept at impersonating James Cagney, Winston Churchill, Peter Lorre. Please, Mr. Michi, don't even mention the name of Peter Lorre. In school, they used to say while the other children were erasing the blackboard, I was erasing the teacher. <laughs> Everyone thinks I'm a treacherous, cold-blooded killer. Peter Laurie, a killer? Oh, that's nonsense. Of course you're not a killer. Why, well, I'd be proud to have you as a friend. Here, let's shake on that. Mm, that's wonderful, Mr. Michi. Just a moment till I wipe the blood off my hands. The blood off your hands? Well, then it's true. You are a killer. Yes, yes. But Humphrey Bogart here forced me to do it. Humphrey Bogart? Yeah, Humphrey Bogart, Michi. <laughs> we had a pretty tough customer. Once we bumped him off... And we tied a rope around his neck and hung him. And we took an axe and cut his head off. Well, how could you do such a thing? You know a better way to kill a turkey? <laughs> oh, kill a turkey? Oh, I thought you were talking about killing a man. What? For Thanksgiving? We tried that once, but it didn't work out. It didn't work out? Yes. No drumsticks. <clears throat> <laughs> well, goodbye, Michi. Oh, now, wait, wait just a minute, man. You're not leaving so soon. Uh, yeah, we got a date with some coppers down at the station house. They want to take a fast look at our identification papers. Well, will it take long? Oh, no, no. It's just a short pause for station identification. Um, yes, well, be sure to hurry back because the second half hour of Elgin's great two-hour Thanksgiving Day Parade of Stars will start right after station identification. Uh, if this guy's leveling, Laurie, we better stick around. How about it, Carpenter? Is this a gag? Why, no, this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> This is KNX in Los Angeles. The Elgin Watch Company's sixth annual two-hour Thanksgiving Day greeting to America, our armed forces overseas, and the men and women in our veterans' hospitals, and shortwave round the world continues with Don Amici, Margaret Whiting, Vera Vaig, Jimmy Durante, the Paige Cavanaugh Trio, Bob Sweeney and Hal March, the Doctors of Harmony, Larry Storch, Yehudi Menuhin, Jack Benny, Mr. Kitzel, Alan Jones, Mary Jane Smith, 
Red Skelton and the Elgin Orchestra and Chorus under the direction of Louis Silvers. Again, your host for the full two hours, Don Amici. To those of you who have just joined us, the very warmest of Thanksgiving greetings from the Elgin Watch Company, the Elgin Jewelers, and all the stars here to share this day of thanks with those of you celebrating Thanksgiving in your homes throughout the nation. Some of our stars were on hand that first Thanksgiving after Pearl Harbor, when Elgin's two hours of stars was a greeting to our boys and girls far away and lonesome overseas in the service. Last Thanksgiving, one of our newcomers was a young lady on her way to fame via the jukeboxes. Today, she's an established radio and recording star. Elgin congratulates and proudly presents Margaret Whiting. I love you, you do. No one means more to me than you do. You take December and smile it. back again when you're away who has a charm that very few do who makes life necessary you do and who can take my dreams and make my dreams Come true. Don't give me three guesses, one will do. Who has a charm that very few do? Necessary, you do. And who can take my dreams and make my dreams come true? Who? Don't give me three guesses. One will. That's smooth as silk, Margaret. I understand since you last joined us here on Elgin's Two Hours of Stars, you've gone and got yourself a radio show with Bob Crosby. That's right, Don. Bing is Barry Fitzgerald, and Bob is me. Bob introduced you to Bing yet, Maggie? Oh, yes, we met just a few days ago. I was helping Bob pick out a set of trains for his kids when we ran into Bing. Bing was buying a train, too. Oh, really? Which one did uh, Bing buy? Well, I think it was the Union Pacific. <laughs> Sometime you want to watch him pick a Thanksgiving turkey out at Santa Anita. Out at Santa Anita? Yeah, he makes the butcher race his eight best birds around the track before he picks the winner. Well, I hope that's not your system, Don. No, I'm the old-fashioned type, Maggie. We get our bird right from Rice's farm. You know, one of those overstuffed old turkeys that runs around all flutter and excited, tail feathers sticking out and gobbling. Oh, Mr. Nietzsche! Vera Bay! What a thrill spending another Thanksgiving with you, you American mouth batten with a mustache. <laughs> oh, one look at you, and I know I have plenty to be thankful for. Yeah, I can see you're making the most of every moment while Bob Hope is away. Oh, yeah, well, you know the old saying when the cat's away, the mouse will play. And you think of yourself as being a little mouse. Oh, uh, well, I must be. Every man I meet tells me to keep my trap shut. <laughs> Uh, but, but don't mention Mr. Hope, Mr. Amici. All he ever thinks of anymore is tea. 
Everyone on his program was so embarrassed when he heard that made that terrible faux pas at Princess Elizabeth's wedding, my goodness. Really? What did he do? Oh, when he heard Elizabeth wore a crown, he tried to get her to brush it with Pepsodent. <laughs> Oh, by the way, Miss Vague, you must remember Margaret Whiting. Oh, must I? Oh, oh yes, of course I must. Yes, how are you, dear? Gee, it's nice seeing you again here uh, on this Thanksgiving, Miss Vague. Oh, uh, well, yes, isn't it a glorious day, dear? It brings back so many memories. I'll never forget the first time I sat down at the table with the grown folks for my first Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, it must have been wonderful eating with the pilgrims. <laughs> Bless your little heart. <laughs> For two pins, I'd put you back in your jukebox and nail the lid on. Oh, now, please, please, Miss Vague. Miss Whiting is much more than a singer on jukeboxes. She has her own radio program for a soup company. Well, they certainly didn't use their noodle. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, Miss Whiting, that your sponsors asked me to pose for their soup ads. Yes, I heard about that. Miss Mock Turtle of 1947. <laughs> but of course, I probably would have done it if I'd had beautiful blonde hair like Miss Whiting. <laughs> yes, her hair is beautiful, isn't it, Miss Bay? Oh, yes, it's beautiful. Tell me, dear, where did you ever get shredded wheat that length? <laughs> Now, Miss Vague, aren't you forgetting today is Thanksgiving? Oh, 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 you're right, Miss Gramicia. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Whiting. After all, we girls have to stick together if we expect ever to take over this man's world, don't we? Women are taking over? Oh, certainly, Mr. Amici. Today, women are doing everything that men can do. Today, we even have women bus drivers. Well, hooray for women bus drivers. Today, we have women lawyers. Hooray for women lawyers. Today, we have women doctors. Hooray for women doctors. In fact, today, there's very little difference between men and women. Hooray for the little difference. <laughs> John, I don't think you're taking Miss Vague seriously, and she's right. Well, of course, Mr. Amici, of course I'm right. And now, don't you be surprised, Mr. Amici, if we even have a woman president one of these days. I'm seriously thinking of running for the office myself. You mean you, mean you want to run the country? You want to rule the roost? Well, certainly, if it's got the right kind of rooster. <laughs> I suppose as a candidate, you have a broad platform. Well, let's not get... Oh, oh, yes, a broad platform. <laughs> yes, you know, like two chickens in every pot, two cars in every garage. Oh, I've got a much better platform than that. Two Gregory Pecks on every sofa. <laughs> oh, I can just picture the day of election. <laughs> Here's your latest news on the election returns. Republicans admit defeat. Agree that from now on, Dewey will only be a weather report. Latest report from Washington. Democrats admit defeat. Truman fails to sweep country. Vague cleans up. Ladies and gentlemen, attention. Ms. Vera Vague is our new president. The ship of state now has a woman driver at the wheel. All ships head for the nearest harbor. And now we take you directly to the White House for an interview with the new president. Madam President, I'm Carpenter from CBS. How does it feel to wear the pants of the United States? Uh, well, confidentially, they're a little tight around the deep south. <laughs> well, Madam President, you must have dabbled in politics for years. Oh, yes, indeed. As a little girl, I collected Hoover buttons. I still have them. Oh, oh they must be very close to you. Oh, they certainly are. They hold up my bloomers. <laughs> Carpenter, excuse me, please. Uh, come in. Oh, it's you. You've finally come. Well, what is your answer? No. No, 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 and no. You won't reconsider? No. Who was that? Mrs. Vashinsky. <laughs> I must remember to get a new hanky. My bugle was a little out of tune. Why, it's James Durante, my secretary of the treasury and guardian of the exchequer. Where have you been? I've been getting dressed for our meeting. Don't I look like I just stepped out of Bond Street? You look more like you stepped your toe in Nightmare Alley. <laughs> Please, if I had starch in my sweatshirt, I'd be this month's man of distinction. <laughs> it's about time you arrived, young man. I've had a terrible day trying to get the Supreme Court to get that new look. They refuse to lower the hems on their black gowns. Too bad. <laughs> 
Too bad. I noticed last week that one of the Justice Gong was so short, his ipso facto was showing. <laughs> uh, uh, tell me, tell me, Mr. Granny, uh, how is everything going at Fort Knox, please? Ghastly, ghastly. I had to spend the whole day cleaning. For the past 20 years, the Democrats have been sweeping all the du- gold dust under the rugs. Oh, oh, be careful you don't lose any of it. There's more gold at Fort Knox than any place in this world. I can see you haven't been to General Meyer's house lately. <laughs> But I'm afraid I, but I'm afraid I'm digressing. I'm here, I'm here with my annual report due to the end of the official year. Yeah. According to my figures, the assets of the fictional Foyt Douchery, after the pro tense of never read no narration uh, of the yeah. of the collateral subsidiaries, uh, they're subtracted from balances accrued through interstate uh, revenues uh, is uh, 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 darling, uh, I uh, just uh, had to rush in and tell you the good news. Oh, it's my secretary of the interior, Margaret Whiting. What's the good news, dear? Well, Madam President, I finally figured out what to do with the White House. I'm changing it to fuchsia. Oh, wonderful, dear, wonderful. White always brings out my bag. <laughs> <laughs> the assets of the official fiduciary of the uh, partial depository. Uh, uh, you can't say good. I'm not trying. <laughs> Indicates the monetary collateral provided at Bretton Woods. Uh, I'm a little in the woods myself here. When total against allowances accrued in lieu of liabilities... And another thing, darling, is provided in the vague plan I'm sending hair curlers to Africa, lipsticks to the Eskimo, and face powder to Saladonia. Uh, Saladonia, where's that? Well, it's a very small country. The people don't smoke, drink, or neck. Uh, no wonder it's such a small country. <laughs> uh, yes. One more interruption from you dames and I'll fill a buster. Oh, go fill your buster somewhere else. <laughs> We're discussing important things now. It's, it's humiliating, but I warn the country. Put a dame in the White House and what have you got? A gushing, a gassing, and a gabbing. No time for anything but blabbing. You have this wonderful country right up the creek. You do nothing but gossip all day. Hooey, plain no hooey. We're as good as Taft or Dewey. We will lower taxes soon as we get back from Saxes. Picking up a bargain. Gaxin, a gappin' and a gassin'. We need an Heiser or a Stassin'. We'll start a Senate investigation and then we, we can, can start, start in on Captain of Captain. Ah, oh, that is great. Vera Vague, Jimmy Durante, and Margaret Whiting will probably never go into business as a trio, but if they did, here's the group they could take a few tips from. It's the Page Cavanaugh Trio. The Page Cavanaugh combination is not made up of three guys named Page, Cav, and Naw. Page Piano Cavanaugh is the leader of the group, which includes Al Viola on the guitar and Lloyd Pratt on the bass. They got together in the army, bounced their way into popularity with the Bobby Sockers on radio and recordings, and will soon be seen featured prominently in three forthcoming films. Here they are, the Page Cavanaugh trio and Okel Baby Dokel. Now, translated into English, this means Okel Baby Dokel. Oko baby doka like a like a baby you if you local baby doka like a me Oko baby doka like a like a hug you if you local baby doka hug me Oko baby doka like a like a kiss on you if you local baby doka kiss on me Oko baby doka like a like a tender you if you local baby doka tender me if your love words won't come out when you've got a lot to say, just talk to the one you're mad about in the Oka Baby Doka way. Say, Oka Baby Doka, like a like a love you. If you Oka Baby Doka, love me. Oka Baby Doka, like a like a marry you. If you Oka Baby Doka, marry me. <laughs> I can tell you why you're charming in the charmingest way, the charmingest way. But when we're cheek to cheek and my speaking starts to weaken, this is what my heart begins to say. Oko baby doka, like a like a baby you, if you local baby doka, like a me. Oko 
baby, don't go like, like a hug me. If you look, oh baby, don't go hug me. Oh baby, don't go like, like a kiss on you. If you look, oh baby, don't go kiss on me. Oh baby, don't go like, like a tender you. If you look, oh baby, don't go tenderly. If your love words won't come out when you've got a lot to say, just talk to the one you're mad about in the Oko Baby Doka way. Say, Oko Baby Doka, like, like, I love you. If you love, Baby Doka, love me. Oko Baby Doka, like, like, I marry you. If you love, Baby Doka, marry me. Oko Baby Doka, marry me. That's wonderful, man. Paige, I don't think you learned to play that way in the Vienna Institute of Music. No, uh, Don, as a matter of fact, I went to Kansas State Teachers College. Flunked everything but advanced calculus. Well, how'd you avoid flunking advanced calculus? I didn't take it. <laughs> well, you might have slipped as a student, but you've certainly chalked up enough successes since then. How about an encore? Well, Don, this being the Elgin program, I think we have just a thing. Well, then let's get to it. <laughs> She had 29 Cadillacs, 29 sables and sacks. But there was something she missed with no Belgian on her wrist. The lady from 29 Palms. She had watches that couldn't compare, constantly under repair. Because the winders were busted, the mainsprings were rusted. Poor lady from 29 Palms. Then one day she heard about Elgin's and Dora Palm mainspring design. Sitting all rusted, she put in her order for 29. The lady was really no sap. She sold all her autos for scrap. And now her 29 fellas are holding on their arms to the lady in 29 palms. Now they've got time on their hands. It's an Elgin so grand. Don't need the lady from 29 palms. That's fine, man, fine. We'll be latching on to some more of the Page Cavanaugh trio later. Most of the established radio favorites who jump through a hooper into your home each week are entertainers who've been at the top for 10 or 15 years. But there are many newcomers making their bid to gain a foothold on radio's ladder of success. Two such men are Bob Sweeney and Hal March. As soon as we heard the work of these two happy rover boys, we felt instinctively they were the perfect type for an assignment on Elgin's Thanksgiving Day program. And here is what happened as they drove to the CBS studio on the way to the two hours of stars. Bob Sweeney and Hal March. Well, Bob, this is the big day, right? It sure is, Hal. How do you feel? A little nervous. Well, you shouldn't be, Bob. The, the trouble with you is you don't have any poise, any confidence. What is it that gives a man joie de vivre, savoir-faire, rubin bleu, parlez-vous? Oh, I don't know about you, but strawberries do it to me. <laughs> well, just relax, you'll be all right, Bob. Well, uh, what are we supposed to do on this Elgin show, Hal? Well, Bob, you know how in baseball, when the bases are loaded, they send in the cleanup man to win the old ball game? Yeah. Well, Don Amici told me that's us. Oh, that's swell. That's only fitting. Well, well here's the studio, Hal. Good. Now, keep your eye open for a parking place. Okay, Hal. Let's see now. Oh, there's a place, Hal. Uh, oh, there. swell. Yeah. A little small, but I think I can squeeze in. Well, hold it, Hal. I'll get out and I'll direct you. Fine, go right. ahead, Bob. Right. Okay, Hal. Now, now cut your wheels in and come back. All right. Yeah. Back some more. Come on. Back, back. Back, back, back. Come on. Back, back, back. <laughs> Got about a foot. <laughs> Well, that's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> Got about a foot. Come on, let's get into the studio. Hey, uh, Hal, before we go into the studio, uh, would you like an oh for goodness sake sandwich? No, thanks, Bob. I... What, what kind of a sandwich? Uh, an oh for goodness sake sandwich. What kind of a sandwich is that? Well, it's two pieces of bread with a piece of bread in the middle. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> See, that's what everybody says. <laughs> Come on. Uh, hey... Uh, let's just cut through the lobby here, huh? All right. All right. I'll hold it, Bob. I want to check myself over before we go in. All right. Well, here's a glass door over here, Hal. Oh, fine. Let's see now. There'll probably be some movies. That... Oh, 
Oh, there you are, Marge. Oh, yes, I agree with you. You beautiful bronze Apollo, you. Let's see now, what kind of condition are you in? Nails properly buffed, cuticles exquisitely trimmed, except for the left index, which is undergoing special therapy treatment. <laughs> Hair neatly combed with the sixth and seventh waves cascading to the starboard. <laughs> <laughs> teeth, dazzling white Hey, Al, how do you keep your teeth so white? It's just an effect, Bob I have a dark mouth <laughs> And the, uh, the tie Just the right amount showing below the collar There Oh, March, March Heaven sent you down for me to love Ooh! <laughs> and, uh, let me take a look at myself, Al. All right. Let's see now. Fingernails, all chewed off. <laughs> Hair, not much. <laughs> Tooth, dazzling white. <laughs> with just the right amount showing below the gums. <laughs> All right, Bob, let's cut through the lobby here and get into the studio. All right, Al. Guys, there certainly is a crowd in the lobby today, yeah. isn't there? Hey, you know, Hal, every time I walk through this lobby with you, uh, I just get so proud. Oh, come now, Bob. No, no, you? honest, Hal. I'm so lucky to have a partner as smart as you. It's really a privilege. No, Bob, really. No, and, and handsome, too. But, boy, you're about the handsomest man in Hollywood. Cut it out, Bob. Not the handsome in the snow. <laughs> really, and the best actor, too. Handsome and smart, and, and the best actor in the world. You're just wonderful. Get my hat, Bob. It flew right over there. <laughs> there you are, Hal. Thank you. Yeah. Well, kid, there's the studio. Now, when we get in there... Uh, oh, just a second, Bob. Here come some friends of mine. Oh. Hiya, haircut. We're on the Elton Show today. Well, who is that, Hal? Gary Moore, the haircut, Bob. Oh. Hiya, voice. Bob and I are on the Elton Show today. Who, who's that, Hal? Frank Sinatra, the Sinatra? voice, Bob. Great guy. Hiya, nose. Doing the big Thanksgiving show today. Who's that, Hal? Jimmy Durante, the nose, Bob. Oh. Hiya, Fanny! <laughs> <laughs> Who is that, Bob? Fanny Bryce, she's a comedian. Oh. Come on into the studio, Bob. Okay. Oh, well, where is he? Where's Mr. Amici? There he is, Bob, right over there. Oh, Don. Don, boy. We're here. Oh, oh, you two finally got here. I was a little worried. Well, never mind, Don, boy. We're here. The old cleanup team. Who do we follow? Well, the next stars are the uh, Doctors of Harmony, and then there'll be Yehudi Menuhin, Jack Benny, and Red Skelton. Gotcha, Don, boy. Bob, got him. Then as we go into the wind-up, I come on for my good night. You got it? Got you, Don. Bob, got him. Then the announcer takes us off the network. Takes us off. Bob, got him. Yeah. And everybody goes home to their Thanksgiving dinner. Then you come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Don, boy, what kind of a spot is that for the old cleanup team? Well, the best spot in the world. Nobody around the studio to bother you. Now get your mops and brooms. <laughs> mops and brooms? Bob, got him. Oh, no. <laughs> You don't have to go any farther than a picnic, party, or church social to find ample evidence that most Americans still get a kick out of raising their voices in song. Not long ago, the Society for the Preservation and Encouragement of Barbershop Quartet Singing in America was started in Oklahoma. Since then, it's snowballed into an international organization with 325 chapters in the United States and Canada. It was Elgin's privilege to honor the SPEBSQSA for preserving an American tradition by inviting the winners of their international competition to join us in celebrating this Thanksgiving. Complete with light suits and straw hats from Elkhart, Indiana, the world's best barbershop quartet, the Doctors of Harmony. <laughs> Say, tell me, how did you boys happen to hit on the light suits and straw hats? We wear them for luck, Don. We were discovered singing at a summer picnic wearing these outfits. Well, it's a lucky thing you weren't discovered singing in the shower. <laughs> Just one thing I don't get. Why do you call yourself a barbershop quartet? Goes back to the good old days, Don. The customers waiting for a barber got together and sang. 
Well, did they always sing in quartets? No, I sometimes understand it. Sometimes took a fifth to get them started. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I see what you mean. And out of this came today's Society of Barbershop Quartets. Yes, only nowadays the object is to blend harmony and chords better than any other group. Sometimes we have as many as five harmonizing notes on one chord. And you always sing unaccompanied without uh, piano or orchestra? Yeah, I think that's why we've never gotten a Christmas card from Petrillo. <laughs> well, I think you get plenty of Christmas cards. After all, our friends listening in at home have heard your medley of old favorites. Elgin presents the Doctors of Harmony. I had a dream dear. You had one Mine was the best dream It was of you Come, sweetheart, tell me Now is the time you I dare, I dare not hope to e'er be thine, to e'er be thine. I only know I love you. Love me and the world is mine. Da 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 dum, da 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 dum, sweet Adeline. My Adeline At night, dear ha, 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 For you bum, 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 In all my dreams Your fair face be You're the flower Thank you, Doctors of Harmony. That was grand. Oh, Don, Don Amici. Oh, Don, my boy. <laughs> there you are. Don, in keeping with the festive spirit of the day, I have stopped by to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. Or have you forgotten me? <laughs> no. Forgotten you? Why, Frank Morgan, I couldn't forget you any more than I could forget Larry Storch. Where are you headed, Frank? All the same place everybody else is headed this time of the year, Don. I'm rushing home to a Thanksgiving dinner, and I can hardly wait to get at the bird. Can hardly wait to get at that old turkey, huh? Can hardly wait to get at the old crow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, Frank, you're not serious. You are having a turkey, aren't you? No, Don Zeno. Turkey is so expensive this year, we're having weasel. <laughs> weasel? Yes, I'm preparing it myself. It's quite an art. <laughs> you have to keep it very moist before you cook it. Well, so long, Don. Frank, Frank, where are you going? Uh, out to wet my weasel. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, Frank, can't you be serious for a moment? Do you think I joke with your jockey? <laughs> I'm, I'm basting it with orange juice. First I pour long ones over it, none of the pilgrims, then I pour short ones. What are the short pours for? Short pours for station identification. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Frank, in the second half of Elson's two-hour Thanksgiving Day greeting to the nation will continue right after we have a short pause for station identification. You're having one, too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, get the oranges. <laughs> this is an unexpected pleasure. Oh, no, this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> K-N-X in Los Angeles. The Al 
Johnson Watch Company, sixth annual to our Thanksgiving greeting to America. Our servicemen, hospitalized veterans, and neighbors around the world starts at second hour. In the next 60 minutes, you'll hear Don Amici, Yehudi Menuhin, Jack Benny, Mr. Kitzel, Alan Jones, Mary Jane Smith, Larry Storch, Margaret Whiting, Red Skelton, and the Elton Orchestra and Chorus under the direction of Louis Silvers. And here's your host for these two hours of stars, Don Amici. <laughs> On behalf of all the stars gathered here in Hollywood today at the invitation of the Elgin Watch Company and the Elgin Jewelers, may I say it's a privilege and a pleasure to be sharing this Thanksgiving with so many millions of other Americans. For Elgin's Two Hours of Stars has become an anticipated part of America's Thanksgiving tradition. And each holiday season, Elgin has made a sincere effort to bring you its diversified listening audience on the farms and in the cities, something for everyone. Many years have passed since that memorable night when a little blonde-haired boy in knee pants came out on the stage of Carnegie Hall in New York, tucked his three-quarter-size violin under his chin, and won his first ovation from the critics. During the war years, he entertained our armed forces in the States and overseas, and gave the first public concert in liberated Paris at the personal request of General Charles de Gaulle. Elgin is proud to present the superb artistry of the world-famous violinist Yehudi Menuhin. Accompanied by his sister, Yalta Menuhin, Mr. Menuhin plays Habanera by Sarasate. Thank <laughs> you. 
That was magnificent, Yehudi Menuhin. It is truly a remarkable occasion when radio is privileged to present the brilliant genius of an artist such as Yehudi Menuhin. To bring two artists of such distinguished caliber and stature together on the same program is almost beyond the scope of the imagination. This Thanksgiving, the Elgin Watch Company has accomplished the impossible. Elgin is privileged to present a musician whose work has been the talk of the music world. His nimble fingers caressing his instrument with a technique that is unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, that great American violin virtuoso, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you, Don Amici. What I wouldn't give for his teeth when I eat my turkey tonight. <laughs> you know, uh, Don, I'm in a terribly embarrassed position as it just so happens. Well, you may not believe this, but the number I had prepared for this evening was the same selection that Mr. Menuhin just played. <laughs> Really, I, I don't know what to do. Well, Jack, I, I'm awfully sorry about this situation. It just happened, that's all. Well, it seems to me you should have planned your program a little better. I mean, if you invited me, you certainly didn't need Mr. Menuhin. <laughs> I mean, by the same token, if you invited Kaiser, you wouldn't need Fraser. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. Well, Jack, there's nothing we can do about it now, and... Believe me, I, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Me? I'm not thinking of myself, Don. I'm thinking of Mr. Menuhin. <laughs> if I'd have come out first, he'd have been dead. <laughs> well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, as long as I have to play on the program this evening, I'd like to point out that Mr. Menuhin's violin and mine are entirely different. You see, uh, Mr. Menuhin has a Stradivarius while mine happens to be an Eastern Columbarius Broadway and Ninth <laughs> You know, Don, I saved my money and bought this violin 40 years ago. 40 years ago? Well, Jack, I thought you were only 38. Don, I started saving money when I was a gleam in my father's eye. <laughs> Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'm in a kind of a spot now. I hardly know what to do as my selection has been, shall I say, nipped by Mr. Menuhin. Now, let's see. Oh, Mr. Menuhin. Mr. Menuhin. Yes? Uh, Mr. Menuhin, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Benny. Benny? Yes, Jack Benny. Jack Benny? Oh, yes, how stupid of me not to recognize you. How's Ida? <laughs> No, no, you're, you're thinking of Eddie Cantor. You see, I'm Jack Benny, the radio comedian, although my real talent lies in the field of music. And incidentally, I want to congratulate you on your rendition of uh, Habanera. Thank you. I know that comes from your heart. Yes, which I intended to play myself. <laughs> I'm sorry that happened. If you had spoken to me before the program, I would have certainly substituted another number. Well, it doesn't really make any difference because I have other numbers up my sleeve too, brother. <laughs> but I was just thinking, Mr. Menuhin, rather than my playing a solo, it might be a good idea if we played a duet. Now, what do you say? Well, I think it would be rather interesting. <laughs> Is there anything in particular you'd care to suggest? Oh, I don't know. I'll sort of leave that to you. Uh, what would you suggest? Well... What about the uh, Perpetuum Mobile of Paganini? Well, I... <laughs> what was that? Uh, what was that, Mr. Emmanuel? Uh, Paganini's Perpetuum Mobile. Perpetuum mobile, mobile, that's mobile. correct, yes. Well, we're back to Kaiser Fraser okay. again. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Emmanuel, that song has been done to death. Isn't there, um, isn't there something else you can suggest, huh? Well, what about the Rondo Capriccioso of Saint-Saëns? 
Sun Sun the the Rondo Rondo what the Capriccioso Capric Capriccioso oh, Yes I I don't know that number never seemed to get anywhere I I mean people people don't hum it anymore. <laughs> Look, uh, Mr. Menuhin, how about our playing Love and Bloom? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's very catchy, you know. Love and Bloom. I'm sorry, I don't believe I know that one. You don't? He's supposed to be one of the world's greatest violinists. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Menuhin, let's you and I play How About Intermezzo. intermezzo. Uh, how would that be? That would be fine. Good, good. Now, look. You take the first train, I'll take the second, and we'll alternate through the number. You see, then there's a place in the middle where we play together in harmony. Now, you take the first train, Mr. Manuel. Uh, yes, Mr. We, we better tune up, I though. I think it'd be yes. a good idea. We... Could I have A, please? <laughs> well, don't mind if I practice a little. Did you... Did you say that was an Amati that you had yes, there? Yes, an Amati. It, uh, hard... Unless you've got a good joke, I wouldn't go any further. <laughs> uh, is that the only violin you have? Oh, no, no, I have two. Is that, is that your, your only? No, I also have a Guarnerius. Oh, a Guarnerius, besides yes. a Stradivarius, yes. I see. Well, yes. I have... Uh, Two violins, too, you know. I play both of them. Both of them? Yes. Both of them together? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, that double chin. I see. <laughs> Could we have an introduction, please? You take the first one. Can you tell the difference? Be here till Sunday, four o'clock. You know. I'm, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> you don't do that fast. You're dead. You know. Will you... Thank you very much. <laughs> Mind if I join you here? Oh, please.
Ah, oh, that is wonderful, Jack Benny, and you who Say, you. Don, isn't that Jack Benny's friend, Mr. Kitzel, applauding off stage over there? Well, yes, yes, Ken, I think it is. You know, he might be interested in giving Jack and Alzin for a Christmas gift. I'm going to ask him. Oh, Mr. Kitzel, Mr. Kitzel. Somebody is calling Mr. Kitzel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Carpenter. Hello, hello, hello. Well, hello, Mr. Kitzel. Say, Mr. Kitzel, I was just mentioning to Don that you might be interested in getting Mr. Benny and Elgin watch as a Christmas gift this year. Of course, giving Mr. Benny and Elgin is just a suggestion. Mm, of course. Uh, who suggested it? Mr. Benny. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree, Mr. Kitzel, it's an excellent idea. Excellent, excellent, yes. <laughs> you know, Elgin now features the exclusive DuraPower Miracle Mainspring, made from an entirely new alloy that won't rust. It eliminates 99% of repairs due to steel mainspring failures. Uh, just about how much would you care to spend on Mr. Benny's gift, Mr. Kitzel? Uh, with me, money is no object. Money's no object? If money was the object, would I be working for Mr. Benny? <laughs> well... <laughs> Regardless of the cost, there's no more cherished gift than an Elgin watch. And what a novelty for Mr. Benny, waking up Christmas morning and finding a lump in his stocking. Oh, peace, pash, a novelty, a lump in his stocking. With Mr. Benny's legs, he's got plenty lumps in his stockings. <laughs> well, an Elgin watch would make a wonderful change, Mr. Kitzel, for the new Elgin's amazing new DuraPower mainspring ensures greater accuracy and precision. It's just one of the many new features I'm sure Mr. Benny would appreciate. You know, when you really get right down to it, Mr. Benny is a man of wisdom. You know, Mr. Benny's sage. Yes, 28. <laughs> no, 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 I, I mean he's a thinker. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> well, I don't have to say another word, Mr. Kitzel. The new Algin speak for themselves. A timepiece that's unexcelled for beauty and skilled craftsmanship. You right, Mr. Carpenter, you right. You know who wants a pickle in the middle with the mustard on top for an Elgin watch for Christmas? I am going to a shop. <laughs> Say no more, Mr. Carpenter. You sold me on the idea and I'm rushing out right now. To buy an Elgin for Mr. Benny? No, to buy an Elgin for Mr. Kitzel. Goodbye, Mr. Carpenter. <laughs> Isn't it true that it's often the little things that we're most thankful for? Touch of a hand, kind word, memories shared with somebody you love. We think of them on days like this, but why not every day? Why not? Well, maybe because we're only human. Like a girl named Linda Clark, for instance. An average, ordinary person. It might be you. Or it might be me. I'd like to bring you briefly Linda's story called Those Little Things by Betty Wright with radio's most accomplished couple, Kathy and Elliot Lewis as Linda and Tom. Linda had no way of knowing that today might be her last on earth. But I knew because, well, I'm her guardian angel. I tried to help her make it a good day. Every passing minute of it. But let me show you the kind of trouble we guardian angels have. Because already the clock is ticking off the seconds in what may be the start of Linda's final day on Earth. She and her husband, Tom, are still asleep. Hmm? Oh. Uh, Linda? Linda? Hmm? It's seven o'clock. You want me to put the water on for coffee? Mm -mm, I'll do it. Okay, honey, I'll run in and shave. You sure you don't want me to get things started? No, oh, thanks, Tom. I'll be up in just a second. Just a second. Just a second. Tricky little things, those seconds. Have a way of getting by before you've done the things you meant to. Because Linda meant to get up and get breakfast. And to Tom, who's in there shaving, it could make a lot of difference. He's got a problem on his mind. He wants someone to talk to. He wants sympathy, advice. That's why I tried at this point to get through to Linda. Linda. Linda, get up. Make him a cup of coffee and some fried eggs. Let him talk to you. He needs to. Let him tell you about that deal he's worried over. What do you say, Linda? Hmm? Mm. But Linda didn't hear me. Those extra seconds that she spent in bed, they put her back to sleep again. 
It wasn't until Tom stopped to give her a gentle goodbye kiss that she awoke. Hmm. Tom. Tom, what time is it? 7.30, honey. Oh, Tom, and I didn't get your breakfast. Oh, that's okay. I can always grab a bite downtown. Linda, you remember that man from Wichita that I hoped to close a deal with? Well, something's come up that's got me kind of worried. What did you say, honey? I'm sorry. I was half asleep. Well, that deal I was telling you about on Saturday... Oh, Tom, if it's 7.30, aren't you going to miss your bus? Well, I can always take a... Well, yeah, I guess you're right. Go back to sleep. And so, Linda, you went back to sleep and let another spay on a precious seconds pass. While Tom went to town with his unsolved problem on his mind and gulped a cup of coffee at the drugstore. And what did you do? You finally got up, bathed, dressed, had yourself a waffle, three slices of bacon with your egg, two cups of coffee. No wonder you're putting on a little weight, my dear. Then you made up your shopping list. Oh, what'll I have for dinner? I really ought to get something special that Tom likes. That's right, Linda. Make it up to Tom for not getting his breakfast. Now, let's see. He's always crazy for those French fried onions and a lean roast. Oh, the roast takes so much watching. Takes so long to cook. I'll get something else that takes less time. Time. What's time for? Except to make some other person happy. Every precious second of it. Time isn't something that you save. It's something that you give. But anyway, you started for the store. On the way, you had to pass Mrs. Weber's house. Mrs. Weber had been sick in bed for three months. You had yet to visit her. And so I told you... Linda, drop in and see Mrs. Weber. Her house is just ahead. She's lonely, Linda. It's not easy being bedridden. She'd appreciate a visit. Oh, dear, I suppose I ought to stop in and see Mrs. Weber. That's a good girl, Linda. She'll wonder why I haven't been in. She came to see me when I was sick. Yes, yeah, she certainly did, and brought you flowers. Of course, she didn't have anything to do but visit. Besides, I hate to go in without bringing her something. Oh, now, that's just an excuse. You know, it's company she wants. And on the other hand, I can't pass the house without going in. She'll see me. Yes, yeah, she sure will, in just another minute. So I, I think I'll cut across and down that side street. And so you took a precious second more and used it to neglect a neighbor. You didn't mean any harm. People don't when they pass up the little things. But it's the little things that count. Like the letter the mailman brought when you got back. Oh, there, Miss Bart. Hope you've got some nice mail for us. Something with a check enclosed. I <laughs> can't guarantee it. Here you are. One letter. Uh-oh. Just the opposite. Looks like somebody wants money. You were right, Linda. Somebody did want money. A relief organization asking for a contribution for the suffering in Europe. Money to buy clothes and food for those who had none. Those whom every minute, every second, brought a little closer to starvation. This winter will be a severe and even tragic one for those in Europe. Children are starving. Their parents lack the strength to work, to rebuild a devastated land. Now, Linda. This is your chance. You can spare at least five dollars. Everybody's asking for money just when prices are so high. It takes all I can scrape together for necessities. You had a manicure last week. Cost you a dollar and a half, remember? Maybe I can send a dollar and a half. Oh, now, Linda, you can do better than that. I really should do better than that. Well, we could really afford to give, well, well, maybe five. That's right, Linda, five. That's good. You'll feel better. You'll be glad. I'll go get your pocketbook and take out a bill. Oh, but heck, tomorrow will be time enough. Time enough? No, you missed it again, Linda. It's too bad you didn't send that money now, because in Belgium there's a little girl for whom time's running out, too. Soon she won't be able to look forward to tomorrow. It won't ever come for her. She might have felt a lasting friendliness toward this, our country, because you sent her a bit of food. Remember, Linda, this may be your last day on Earth. One never knows. If you did, I think you'd act quite differently. Of course, Tom doesn't know about it either. But it's after supper now. He's eaten the liver you so easily prepared for him. Yes, you settled for liver at the store, remember? It takes less time. And you're sitting before the fire. Linda, how'd you like to get out that album of old records? We haven't listened to them in a long time. It's a good idea, Linda. There's something about music, old familiar music that 
brings people closer. Where are those old records, honey? Especially that one, If you were the only girl in the world. Now's your chance to the share this evening with Tom. Remember, it may be your last. But, Tom, you promised me you'd fix that toaster. Oh, Linda, not that. Not the toaster, now. Oh, that can wait. It's been a long time since we played those records. Well, you're always yelling about the burned toaster and make it in the oven. It won't take you all night. Oh, all right. Where is the darn thing? In the kitchen. Oh, don't look so unhappy, honey. I tell you what. You fix the toaster, and I'll run across the street and borrow that dress pattern from Jane. And then when you're through, we'll listen to the records. Okay. All right, honey. Careful crossing the street. Oh, don't worry about me. I'll be all right. So you started for Jane's across the street. You should have waited to play those records, Linda. You should have turned the lights low, snuggled up on Tom's lap, and listened to that favorite tune of yours and Tom's. Would have been nice remembering. Remembering the Halloween dance, the ride home in Tom's coupe. That was the first time he kissed you. Remembering the night you told your mother that he was the one. The happy tears in her eyes when you married him. The time you and Tom quarreled. And the time you came back for keeps, the baby you talked about. The plans you'd drawn up for your home. These were the little things. These were your life. But time's running out, Linda. And with it, your chance to make good all those little, unaccomplished things. You're crossing the street now on your way to Jane's. The lights are dim, the corner's sharp, the car's coming fast, it turns, you don't see it. Linda, Linda, watch out! Well, folks, that's the story. The story about little things. Of course, nobody knows what day is his last day on Earth. Look at me. That's how I got here. Why, I'm Linda's guardian angel. And as guardian angel, I could tell you about your last day, except I'd be violating ethics. Might be tomorrow, next year, 50 years from now. Might be any day at all. Which makes those little things so terribly important. Because, folks, it's the little things that make the big things. Drops of rain that make a rose grow. Kindly acts that lead to love. Words of prayer that reach to heaven. Give it a thought for me. Will you? You hear that sound? That's the beating of a human heart. Yes, a human heart, the pulsating mechanism that pumps steadily throughout the lifetime of each one of us. Now you'll hear a different kind of sound, the sound of time in its flight. The electrical impulse that produced that steady beep, beep, beep had its origin in the famed observatory of the Elgin Watch Company, the observatory that times your Elgin Watch to the stars, time accurate to hundreds of a second. This time is the precise standard used by Elgin craftsmen while they're making, testing, and adjusting Elgin watches. Elgin Observatory Time is also the official time of United Airlines. And now to keep this star-timed accuracy, Elgin's new DuraPower mainspring gives a permanency of timekeeping performance and freedom from trouble never before possible in any watch. For well, this miracle mainspring completely overcomes rust, the greatest cause of mainspring breakage. The Elgin DuraPower mainspring eliminates 99% of watch troubles due to steel mainspring failures. Surely the person for whom you plan the gift of a watch this Christmas will be so much happier with an Elgin. <laughs> The Elgin Watch Company will continue its two hours of stars Thanksgiving greeting right after a short pause for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX in Los Angeles. The Elgin Watch Company's sixth annual two-hour Thanksgiving Day greeting begins its final half hour with Margaret Whiting, Red Skelton, the world's famous violinist, Yehudi Menuhin, 
Alan Jones, the Elgin Orchestra and Chorus, are the direction of Louis Silvers, and your host, Don Amici. Once again, may I extend Thanksgiving Day greetings to those of you who have just cleared your table, washed the dishes, and gathered around your radio with family and friends to share this day with us in the warmth of good cheer and fellowship. This Thanksgiving, it's our good fortune to be able to bring back many of Elgin's stars for an encore. When we asked Alan Jones to be prepared to sing for us again, he very graciously suggested that instead of a solo, why not make it a duet? A duet with the young coloratura soprano you heard earlier this afternoon, Mary Jane Smith. This, uh... It should be quite a thrill for Mary Jane singing with you, Alan. Well, if this were the Elgin Christmas Day program, she could sing with Lawrence Melchior. Oh, but I'm looking forward to singing with you, Mr. Jones. Really, Mary Jane? You think I sing better than Lawrence Melchior? Oh, no, uh, but you're much better looking. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Thank you. I've admired you ever since I saw you in The Firefly. Well, there you are, Alan. Hasn't you wonderful manners? Yes, wonderful manners and uh, a wonderful memory. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You got almost as early a start singing as Mary Jane, didn't you, Alan? Oh, I started music school when I was about six. I had a soprano voice and long golden curls. Well, the teacher must have thought you were a girl. She did. I'll never forget the day I had my curls cut off. I bet the teacher was surprised. So was the little boy who used to carry my books home for me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Alan, this is such an impressive moment on Elgin's Two Hours of Stars. You and Mary Jane about to sing together. I really ought to introduce you as, uh, oh, Signor Raffinello and... Madame Gallipacci Galli. Well, why, why Signor Raffinello and Madame Gallipagucci? <laughs> well, who's going to believe two great operatic singers could be named Smith and Joan? <laughs> However, I think any doubts will be dispelled when we've heard you sing Oscar Strauss's beautiful While Hearts Are Singing. Elgin is proud to bring together Alan Jones and Mary Jane Smith. <laughs> is bringing love once again listen in gladness melody red melting a sadness in Summer twilight was fading We sat in the garden alone As rivers of night serenading My dreams with a mystical tone The leaves seemed to thrill to each measure And the balls beat in time to each train Listen in gladness, 
wonderful Mary Jane Smith and Alan Jones. You made all our hearts sing. The infectious, grinning goodwill of one of radio's greatest entertainers can be felt right through your loudspeaker. Elgin gives you the man who never comes in out of the rain because it's moisturized. Red Skelton! Thank you very much, Don. And uh, I brought along a little story from the Skelton scrapbook of satire. It's called A uh, Child's Thanksgiving. Verna Felton will be the grandmother, Lorene Tuttle will be the mother, and Pat McGeehan, the grandfather. <laughs> Junior! Oh, good heavens, he slipped out of his shackles again. <laughs> Junior! Junior! Uh-oh, the voice of me censor. <laughs> yeah, kiddo. Come here, it's Nama. Well, I knew it wasn't Mrs. Hush, you know. <laughs> oh, there you are. Huh? Junior, I don't know what to do. The turkey's missing from the icebox. Well, what do you want me to do, take his place or something? <laughs> no. I just want to know if you know anything about it. Well, uh, please, I'm busy playing Pilgrim Doctor now, if you don't Junior, mind. Junior, hmm? answer. Good heavens, what are you doing with that turkey under the sun lamp? Well, the turkey was cold. He had goose pimples all over him, and I was trying to warm him up, you know, make him look like a turkey again. Shoot, come here to me. No. Now, you've practically ruined my Thanksgiving dinner. No, no, don't, don't you hit me, don't hit me. I'm not going to hit you. Well, what are you doing with that broom? Going to brush your teeth or something? <laughs> You, you look, you as much as lay one little pinky on me, and I gonna tell on you. You'll tell what? I will tell everyone that you came across on the Mayflower, and that you had a crush on the captain, too. I did not. Oh. I'm not that old. Oh, no. <laughs> We're coming to Plymouth Rock. Captain Standish, you're really a great seaman. Kiss me, my Puritan hero. Sam! <laughs> Junior! Come here to me. Come here to me. No, no, no. I ought to teach you a lesson. That ought to teach you a lesson, too. Next time, wear your glasses. That turkey's all black and blue where you spanked him. <laughs> Which reminds me, I can't find my glasses. Well, that's because I put them on the kitty cat. The cat's wearing my glasses? Sure, Why? You, you said that you wished that he wouldn't fight with the other cats on the block, so I thought if he was wearing your glasses, the other cats would leave him alone, see? Junior, hmm? honey, please behave yourself while I put this turkey back in the oven and help your mother prepare the dinner. How long is it before we eat? I ain't hungry. Boy, I hope you cook something I like yeah. today. What um, do you like? Oh, hmm? What do you like? Oh, I like chocolate-covered chocolate with chocolate syrup. <laughs> <laughs> You have a sweet tooth, Junior. Well, I wish I knew which one it was. Boy, I'd eat it. I know that. <laughs> hey, when are we going to eat? I'm hungry. Well, just as soon as the turkey's done and your grandfather gets home. Oh. I wonder what's holding him up. What's holding him up? Mm hmm I could answer that, but it would only lead to bloodshed. <laughs> now, Junior, you mustn't think such things. <laughs> your grandfather only went down to the bakery to get some rolls. Yeah, and as usual, he'll come home with a bun on, boy. <laughs> Mother, come help me with... The... Mother, what happened? Oh, Junior tried to cook the turkey with the sun lamp. Uh-oh. He would. Junior, go upstairs and wash your hands and face and get ready for dinner. Okay, Mommy, now, that's going to work, that's going to work. And Junior, hmm? don't forget your ears. Why, did I leave them there? Oh, go on now, go on. I'm going to wash me face, I'm going to wash me face. I'm going to wash me... I'm not going to wash with water, though. I'll just dab on some cold cream like me mummy does. I just a little dab here, dab, dab, dab. Here, dab, 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 dab. Oh, my, my. Oh, my, I'm going to look like Lady Easter, boy. <laughs> now, let's see. Now, I'll rub the cold cream off with me towel. Now, where's me towel? Let's see. This one says Mom. This one says Dad. Here is mine. The one with a skull and crossbone done. <laughs> Now, I just wiped the cold cream off for me widow kisser. There, now, back for the face inspection. You're going to go and get me face inspected. Well, I might as well use the banister. Here I go. <laughs> me slingshot in my pocket got caught on the top post. <laughs> Here I is, kiddo, ready to make a glutton out of me, Joe. All right, now, let's see. Did you wash your face clean? Well, at least it's just more of a tattletale gray now. It's not... Now, Junior, <laughs> I want the whole story. Did you wash your hands? Yes, ma'am. Your face? Yes. Your ears? The one you talk in, yes. <laughs> How long are we going to be before we eat? Oh, I'm hungry. It won't be long, dear. Junior, come and look at the turkey. It's almost ready. Miss him, miss him. 
Oh, boy, he nice and brown and fat. Am I going to get a drumstick, huh? Ooh, keep your hands off that turkey. Why, will he bite me? How could he bite you? He's dead. Dead? Yes. When are we going to hold services? <laughs> Don't be silly. Hey, Nemo, when, when a turkey is born, does he know he's going to wind up on a platter? Oh, I don't think so, dear. Mm. Now stand back so you don't get burned. You know, sometimes I wish I was a widow turkey. I would have hopped out of me egg and just run around and chase worms and, and, and take anything anybody would want to feed me. I, I would eat everything I could get me beak on, you know. And then I would strut around the barnyard and, and gobble, 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 like that, you know. And then finally one day some man would come over and he'd say, I is a butcher. And then he would buy me and he'd fill me for the rock so I would weigh more when he sold me. <laughs> And then somebody would come up with a great big axe and he'd chop my head off and then they'd pick all my feathers off of me. And boy, I would stand around and shiver and goose pimples would hop all over me, you know. And then they would base me and put me in the oven and... Oh, no, 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 no! What? What happened? I scared me down! Boy! Oh, boy! Oh, baby. Oh, woman. Bless his little heart. Yeah, bless your heart. Now, stop crying, Junior. Oh, can I have a drumstick? Well, you can have a drumstick if you're a good boy. Yeah? You'll be fed according to the way you behave. Mm-hmm. Well, looks like I get the nick again, boy. <laughs> I wonder what's keeping father. Well, don't worry about him. You know when he gets home, you'll hear the sirens on the police car. <laughs> Junior, you've got to learn to respect your elders. Well, don't bore me out. Goodness me. I, 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 you tell me to respect me elders, but I don't consider you my elder. You are so young, so pretty looking. Why, I just imagine you as another widow kid. You are so I young. I still think that... So beautiful, you is. Do you mean that, Junior? Sure. Anything wrong? Here, Junior. A big kiss for you. <laughs> Boy, that old P.T. Barnum knew what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody at the door. Somebody at the door. I will see who it is. Oh, d -d don't run. You might trip and fall and knock all your teeth out. And I don't want to have to vacuum again. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you sure does love me, don't you? I see who's at the door. I see who's at the door. Oh, hello, Grandpa. Hello, Junior. What are you staring at me for? You look so pale. Are you sick? No, I wash my face. Come on. Let's go eat. Let's go eat. Let's go eat. <laughs> Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm so hungry I could eat a bear. Of course, a bear could eat me, too. Hey, Grandpa, if I ate a bear and a bear ate me, which would be inside of who? And why? Well, there's a brilliant line in it, huh? <laughs> Sorry I said that, boy. <laughs> in fact, I didn't. I, I lost my place. I didn't know what I was. <laughs> Is that your grandfather? Yes, it is. Well, let's eat before the food gets cold. Yeah, come on. Wait till you see the turkey and the cranberries and the mashed potatoes. Oh, boy, what a dinner. Hurry, Grandpa. I'm sure glad we, we cooked that old turkey. He was the meanest thing I ever saw, that old turkey. He didn't like me, you know. Oh, did you tease him? Oh, no. Might have plucked a feather here and there to play Indian with, but didn't tease him, you know. Was, well, I was all set, boys. A good thing you killed him when he was dead, you know. I was all set to wait till he go to sleep and then tie his feet to the perch. I'd fix that old boy. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Junior, where do you get such ideas? Well, I don't waste my time, boy. When I'm not doing anything, I'm building up emergency in uh, reserve, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just a widow, kid. I can't read that stuff. Now, don't lie. <laughs> My, my, what a beautiful dinner. Yeah, isn't it nice, huh? Isn't it nice? Yes, Junior. God has been good to us. Yeah? Maybe if the entire world took time out to give thanks, there would be less disturbance and starvation. Yeah. You sit here, Junior. Yeah, okay, come on, let's eat, let's eat, let's Junior, eat. watch your manners. Why, somebody gonna steal them? <laughs> come on, let's eat. Now, just let's... a second, young man. Pat, will you say grace? No. No, I think today Junior should ask the blessing. He's old enough now. You want me to ask for blessings? Yes, that's a splendid idea. Okay. Go ahead, Junior. I will say, I'll ask the one, I'll say the one that Grandma has been teaching me now. Everybody bow your head, bow your head now. Dear God, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, 
and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Junior, you're supposed to ask for blessings. You're reciting the Constitution of the United States. Well, if that isn't a blessing, I never heard of one. You know, I'm sure God will approve, especially now when so many are misusing it for, for its real meanings, you know. The child's right. I don't know of a better reason for giving thanks to our Almighty. It's a wonderful blessing, Junior. Don't let us interrupt you. The blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. That was terrific, Red Skelton. Good music is one of the most joyous things life has to offer, and it is fitting that on this day of Thanksgiving, Elgin can again invite you to listen to the world-famous violinist, Yehudi Menuhin, as he plays Dini Q's exciting Ora Staccato. Wonderful Yehudi Menuhin. You know, Don, it's too bad Red Skelton had to rush away so soon. We got a chance to see Junior, but uh, what happened to that other character from his show? The fellow from the country, uh, Clem, uh, Clem... Oh, uh, yeah, Clem, uh, uh, Clem... Uh, Cleedlehopper's the name. <laughs> <laughs> ain't hard to say, you know. Just shift your tonsils into second between the cadiddle and you'll hopper right over to it. <laughs> well, howdy, Clem, howdy. Howdy duty to you, too. We've certainly heard a lot about you. Lies, nothing but lies. <laughs> <laughs> Can't prove a thing, brother Now, wait a minute, Clem You mustn't feel that way yeah. I think of you as a man of distinction Perspicacity and, uh, may I say, intelligence well, You can, but it won't do you any good <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've uh, got to be going I'm busy I'm, I'm working on a new invention Something to carry around my pocket That will tell time to Oh, uh, you're inventing a watch yeah. Well, how do you like that? I got started on it And somebody steals the idea already <laughs> Well, Clem, you're just a little late getting started. Watches were invented in 1500. Besides, if you need a watch, you'd want the newest model available. You'd want a new Elgin watch. What makes you think that? 
Well, because the new Elgin watches are not only the most beautiful and most accurate timepieces ever made, they contain the greatest watchmaking development in 200 years, Elgin's miracle DuraPower mainspring. Ooh. You see, DuraPower eliminates 99% of watch repairs due to steel mainspring failure. Mm. And you know how inconvenient it is to always have to get something fixed. Yeah, they still can't make me work right, I know. <laughs> now, Clem, I, I don't think you understand. Ooh. You see, all it takes to break the mainspring in an ordinary watch is a tiny pinpoint of Russ. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, uh... <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> What causes rust? Oh, uh, no, yeah. High humidity with a sudden drop in temperature causes condensation of a droplet of moisture inside the case. We'll do tell. <laughs> in other words, Clem, it rains inside your watch. Well, that's California for you. <laughs> you see... <laughs> You see, up until now, Clem, that rainy condition inside your watch was an awful nuisance because of the old-fashioned spring in there. Well, there's a spring in there. Well, no wonder it gets wet. Well... <laughs> oh, Clem. <laughs> Clem, you're a moron. And my father before me. <laughs> Say, tell me something, Mr. Carpenter. Where can I get one of these uh, Dewar Power ma mainsprings? Well, the famous Lord and Lady Elgin's and Elgin Deluxe. In fact, all Elgin watches have these new miracle mainsprings at no extra cost. Lovelier than ever, Elgin's now give you a longer-lasting accuracy. This year, there are more reasons than ever for wanting an Elgin watch. Yeah, good thing you were standing there. I wouldn't have had anything to say, would I? <laughs> Is your brain in working order? Yeah, but my mainspring's busted, I know that. This is our Thanksgiving Day. In a world of want filled with the homeless and the helpless, where despair and bitterness keep company with fear, our very nation itself has become the symbol of plenty. As we gather together this Thanksgiving in our homes throughout our country, we give thanks that our homes are in this country, our country. It means so many different things to all of us, but all of these things described so stirringly in a New York Times editorial. It is the land itself, the sun coming up behind the white mountains and setting in the glory the Golden Gate. It is men at work, the farmer, the fisherman, the truck driver, the clerk in the office the housewife doing the dishes and sending the children off to school, the teacher, the doctor, the priest, the minister, the rabbi. It is the pilgrims dying in their first terrible winter, the Minuteman standing his ground at Concord Bridge. It is the wagons and the men on foot going westward over Cumberland Gap, floating down the great rivers, rolling over the great plains, to settle on their new, their own lands. It is men standing up in every generation to fight for the old ideals and the old rights at risk of ruin or of life itself. These are flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, blood of our blood, a lasting part of what we are, each of us and all together. It is a great multitude of people on a pilgrimage, common and ordinary people, charged with the usual human failings yet filled with such a hope as never caught the imaginations and the heart of any nation on earth before. The hope of liberty, the hope of justice, the hope of a land in which a man can stand straight, without fear, without rancor. This is our country, its people of every race, color, and religion, giving thanks to God for all that is ours this Thanksgiving day.
temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you, Alan Jones. That was inspiring. This is Don Amici saying it's been wonderful celebrating Thanksgiving with you, and it will be my pleasure to be with you again on Christmas Day. Ten Pops presented by the makers of Chiffon Flakes and Armor Can Meats and Lemon Abner presented by the makers of Alka Seltzer, usually scheduled on Thursday afternoon, but many of these stations were not heard today due to the special broadcast you have just heard. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The previous special broadcast canceled the programs usually heard during that time for today only. This is KNX Los Angeles. Welcome back. Some really good and fun stuff in here, uh, including the Barbershop Quartet and just some great comedic uh, talent. You've got Jack Benny, Red Skelton, and uh, Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore. It's also nice to hear Larry Storch. I know uh, Larry Storch from F Troop. You know, when I hear that name, I'm automatically going to think Corporal Agar. And it's nice to hear him in a different role and showing off uh, some of his talent. I thought his Frank Morgan was probably the best. Uh, there was a reason Donnie Amici reminded us that uh, we weren't hearing from Larry Stork, so we'd realize that it was him. I don't know if I would have caught it uh, otherwise. Now, some of the drama, particularly the one with the woman who this was her last day on Earth, uh, can seem a bit heavy-handed. It's probably really important to remember in that case the times in which uh, these uh, were made. It was just after World War II where we were all aware that life can be short and there are no uh, uh, promises that uh, are 100% guaranteed. And life isn't about getting a list of all the things you want or all the experiences you want. Uh, they had s this generation had seen so many people die that they were aware of the mortality and the fragility of human life. And so the focus is, what can you do for others in the time that you have? So it makes sense in the context of the time, even though it uh, may make us e even more uncomfortable than the original audience on that count. And, of course, Red Skelton ends his comedic sketch in a way that uh, is uh, very moving, as he would often do on special occasions. And I have to say, just a, a lot of great comedic talent in this one. Truly an all-star show. So I really hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you back here around Christmas time. Uh, in the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net, and you can check me out over on my regular show at the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.